Okay, everyone, and welcome to the last session of the first day. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stuart to you. Um, his talk title is, is very interesting to me because it has words I don't understand. <laughs> um, Stuart works at Springload, which is a design-led digital agency based here in Wellington. Uh, please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Hey everyone, um, or as my people would say, all right. <laughs> um, translation, kia ora. Hi. Um, first of all, I, I like to say it's been a really fun day so far. Um, it feels really cool to be standing up here in front of everyone. Um, it's my first talk, first time speaking, so this is a cool experience for me. And it's really cool to see the JavaScript community in New Zealand all rallying together. Um, and I understand it's quite late in the day, so thanks for hanging around. Looking forward to some beers afterwards. I'll, um, I'll kick off with some credentials about me first, um, get to know each other a little bit. I'm Stuart, I'm from Scotland, and it was only la last August that I bundled up all of my contents, um, threw them in a container ship, and um, moved them all over here. And I think there's a pun in there about DevOps somewhere. Um, my background, um, I studied computer science, but my roots are in brand and design agencies, and from that I've got this empathy with clients and understanding the real problems. And mixing them together, I've got this interest in high-level architectures about systems that we develop. So it's an interest in design with a capital D. At Springload, I split my time between developing Python and JavaScript, HTML and CSS. And along with that, I get to spend time with all of these lovely developers. <laughs> um, OK, back to the topic at hand. This is the title of um, my uh, talk today, Exploring Static Isomorphism. I'm not going to go into the debate about isomorphic or universal naming. Um, it's a catchy title. <laughs> I think, first of all, we'll talk about why I've arrived at this, the, the process that's taken me here. What's the problem that I've been trying to solve? At Springload, we create a lot of content-heavy websites. Um, and this is where all the, the work came from. We, we do a lot of uh, information architecture and a lot of user experience work, but we can't always dedicate resources like you would for a speci specific product to um, the, the implementations that we build. We do like the, the solutions that modern JavaScript tooling offers us. We can implement style guides and reusable components using React or Vue or whatever tools that we choose to do. We can implement some um, really in-depth testing as well. And these are all solutions that um, we're interested in but find it difficult to get into our workflow at the moment. So we've been investigating um, tools and architectures that we can use to squeeze these in. The purpose of this talk is to share what I've been learning uh, along this process. And the summary of this, we're going to take the characteristics of what a static website might offer. You get um, reliability. Um, it's simple and cheap to host. And we're going to merge that with the characteristics of a JavaScript application, the control that you get over routing and rendering, the ability to test, and reusability. We're trying to find this happy middle ground. Overall, we're looking for a simple solution that doesn't get in the way of us as developers. We're aiming for simplicity. This is what um, we're going to talk about through the structure. First of all, how we got here, how the, the ecosystem of JavaScript has evolved and progressed, and how the tools have led us to this point in time. And the principles of this uh, architecture, static isomorphism, that I've been um, working towards. And then we're going to kind of stress test this idea and see if, there's any ho if we can poke any holes in it with a, a prototype that I've been playing around with as well. So how did we get here? The, the, the server and the client, they're in this kind of tug of war with each other at the moment. The, even for like the last 10 years, as JavaScript has progressed, the client's been trying to pull control closer to um, where the user is, trying to control routing and rendering on the, the device itself rather than a server. So by server, we're, we're talking about um, traditional programming languages like PHP and Python and Ruby, 
using frameworks or CMSs like WordPress and Drupal and uh, Rails and Django. But we're slowly moving towards, or very quickly even, moving towards client-side JavaScript apps um, using tools like Backbone and Ember, um, Angular, React, or Vue. This is all, the, all of this uh, control shifting to the client has been enabled by the progression of JavaScript. So we're now in this era of single page JavaScript applications. The control shifted over to the client. He wins. <laughs> he's got your control. He's in, he's in control of um, the routing of your application, the rendering. Um, so the initial request that gets sent to a server, um, you get nothing initially. Have you ever seen the, the pages in books? It's kind of just blank pages for padding, just to make sure all the pages are even and so it closes in the end. It's kind of like this. It's just functional, so it makes sure your, your website works. Once the, the JavaScript bundle loads, then you see your actual content. Um, in a way, we're abstracting the responsibilities that a server usually handles onto the, the client. Like I've mentioned, routing and markup. And historically, this kind of breaks the conventions that we've become accustomed to on the web. Um, it's not breaking web or internet protocols, but it's going against what we've been used to. It's kind of bending the, the protocols of the internet to our will. Uh, if you look at the, the source of a single page application, the initial response that you get from a server is absolutely plain, depending um, on the implementation. But th there's no like meta information, there's absolutely no content in the page. It's just a skeleton ready for your JavaScript application to boot into. Um, because of this, there's, there's been solutions that we start talking about isomorphic or universal JavaScript. In this scenario, not only does the client win, but the server kind of wins as well. They've both got control, they're sharing it together. First of all, um, the, the code is executed on the server and it renders your, web, um, your website and it sends a request to the client, all with uh, the content inside of it. Then the exact same code is bootstrapped and executed on the client, loading um, an initial data dump that you might embed into a global variable. And the smart alg algorithms that come with React, for example, or Vue, they can bootstrap this so it reuses the markup on the page. So it, it's efficient. There's um, some existing approaches um, that we're going to compare, including those. And to kind of set a baseline of um, this static isomorphism and see if it improves on what we've already got, we've been thinking about some points of comparison that we can use to compare them all. So I'll fire through these very briefly. Something that we're really interested in and we find important is how friendly um, to SEO that an implementation is for a client since typically content websites or brochure websites, we need it to be easy for a search engine crawlers and robots to access um, well-structured content. We, it should also be easy to progressively enhance based on the client capabilities. It's really important. We can't forget about people um, with older devices, for example, that can't run uh, a full JavaScript bundle. We need to make sure that the website's accessible and navigable for all users. So if uh, the JavaScript fails or if they've got JavaScript disabled, it's only to be usable or readable in some way. It needs to be considerate to performance. Uh, it, we're going to see what's the best approach for optimizing the delivery of your website. Does it introduce any extra attack surface? Is it considerate to the constraints of your client's budget, for example? And most importantly for me, does it introduce any extra complexity for you and your team? We want to keep things simple and maintainable in the long term. So going back to the three approaches, um, client side only, isomorphic and universal are two that we've already touched on. 
and another one called pre-rendering, which we'll go into how it works. The client side only, um, we get an empty skeleton from the server, it loads the JavaScript, and the client holds the full responsibility for routing and rendering. If we compare those to the points of comparison, it's not SEO friendly because we're not getting any content back from the server. It's difficult to progressively enhance because there's no HTML on the page when we get it straight away. So if JavaScript's disabled, they get nothing. And the same goes for accessibility there. It is pretty good in um, terms of performance because we're getting a, a static HTML file returned from the server. Um, there's a small attack surface for security. It's pretty cheap and efficient to get up and running, so it's good for budgets, and it's simple. If we compare um, a universal or isomorphic approach to this, the, the server is returning a dynamically generated HTML content, which is sweet. We like that. Um, the initial page is rendered and then delivered to the client. The, it loads the JavaScript and then decorates it and improves it. So this is SEO friendly because we can put all sorts of stuff in the meta tags or we get the real content that search scholars can go through. We can progressively enhance really easily and it's great for accessibility. On the other hand, it introduces more complexity around um, an extra web server that's involved because we have to have another node server that's rendering this first and then sending it to the client. Um, that introduces issues around authentication because you have to start dealing with uh, authentication tokens or session cookies, for example, and passing them around the, the, between the client and the web server back to an API somewhere. Um, this extra complexity introduces budgetary concerns as well. There's one other option that exists that I looked into as well, and this is pre-rendering, um, which is quite interesting. It's an unhappy middle ground between those two previous ones. It serves content based on user agent sniffing, which is not great, I don't think. Um, the, the crawlers and robots get um, a rendered HTML document, whereas us ordinary clients get, um, oh, it's sliding, you're right, Kirk, <laughs> stay. Um, the users get an HTML skeleton like the client side only, but the, the callers and robots get the full fat content. This is um, a quick screenshot from the GitHub repository of um, a pre-render library, for example, and you'll see the point um, one up there. It's doing some user agent sniffing, which isn't great, and I think it uses PhantomJS under the hood of it, so we're introducing intro Reducing more complexity there. Comparing it to the other points, again, is SEO friendly because uh, the search callers are getting the content that they want, but beyond that, it doesn't offer many more benefits, I don't think. When we look over these, um, us as a business, it, it doesn't really fit the bill for what we want to achieve for our clients. So we started thinking, are there any other options? So we'll start thinking about the principles of this static isomorphism and how it reuses existing ideas, but just puts them together in a new way, which seems to work quite well, I think. But beyond what we talked about, the aims that we want to achieve through this, we want to encourage a maintainable code base that all of our develop developers can work on efficiently, enable a great user experience, both for us as developers, for the user and the client as well, I guess. We want to make sure we can implement the best practices. And like I said, simplicity is great. We want to keep that. This is the life cycle that you might undertake if you want to implement this. When you're developing your application, it, you'd go about your day-to-day um, -day duties just as you would with any other JavaScript application. You can make use of any development aids that you want to, like hot reloading and testing and linting. It's when you get to the build stage um, is the different part to this architecture. But you can build um, the, this isomorphic application either locally or as part of a continuous integration development workflow. You uh, take a list of routes, um, that's what to render. You take a render function, is how to render it, and you compile all of these pages to individual HTML files. So you've got your whole website as static files. 
And then you can deploy all of these to static file hosting, which is nice and uh, cheap and easy. And how that would work in terms of a client request, a client would um, go and request the static file, which you get all of the content. It's nice and quick because there's no rendering on a server to do. It would then load the client-side JavaScript bundle and bootstrap into it like it would with a typical isomorphic uh, architecture. And there's some extra benefits to using it in the same, uh, to using it in a, a static kind of architecture. We can make use of CDNs, and because all of the JavaScript assets are stored along with the HTML files, you can use HTTP2, and it'll pull everything down the same pipe. And I think for us, if you compare it to the, the criteria, it takes a lot of the boxes for us. It's SEO friendly because all of the content's on the page. We can progressively enhance because the content's there and build things up in the client. It's performance considerate because it's a static website, essentially, and then we're improving it on the client side. It's better for security than having a web server pre-rendering the um, JavaScript app because there's um, less surface to attack there. So this was the idea that I had. We've come down to this path, but I want to make sure that it, it's kind of fit for purpose and maybe we could use it on a client project, for example. And in order to do that, I started working on this prototype implementation to really test it out. Um, so I, this is the idea. It's an online sunshades retailer called ISO. Clever, eh? Yeah. Um, and this, this imaginary company, I used it to stress test the idea through a number of different scenarios. The, the first scenario, static content, just serving um, plain stuff that doesn't change from the server to the client. Um, dynamic content, which would be the, we'll have an example as well, um, protected content that you might need authentication first before you um, access it. So if you look at static content first, this is an example of what could be returned from a server. This would be the HTML, for example, before the JavaScript loads. And then when the JavaScript does load, it's the exact same. Nothing's changed. Um, it's the same view that Google or um, Bing or any other crawlers might see as well. Now we can look at some dynamic content. This is the static file that would be loaded from the server first. Um, the initial kind of loading state would be checking stock because um, you, you don't want to continuously render out the stock that might become um, inaccurate. And then on the client side, once the JavaScript ap application loads and goes and checks the API, for example, at that point it would load and say that there's some in stock. If you had uh, a website route that was protected behind authentication. The initial route from the server might have some loading things saying, checking your credentials. Once the JavaScript loads on the client, um, if you're authenticated, maybe it, it's checked against an API. At that point, the, the page would load and give you whatever your orders. If you're unauthenticated, it could give you um, a login page. Along this way, I came across um, one caveat in the logic, which I'm still not convinced on, but I think, depending on the use case, it's acceptable. Supposing we're using uh, an API. Um, in the, the prototype that I built, I was using Contentful. Um, every time that the Contentful information is saved, it would trigger a rebuild on a continuous integration machine, for example. Um, between clicking Save, if you click Save, um, the existing static content would be out of date until the CI machine has rebuilt it. So there's maybe a few minutes of um, still content. Um, whether that's acceptable is depending on your use case, I guess. So a final word on um, my experience with this, just diving a little bit deeper into what I was using. Um, I built it all using React and its friends. Content for was a backend API. I also built um, a Webpack plugin that listened for uh, 
the JavaScript bundle being built. And then at that stage, it rendered out all of the static files. And that's it so far. Um, this is my Twitter handle if anyone wants to get in touch. And these are some similar conversations if uh, anyone wants to read a little bit more into the ideas. Thank you. OK, is there any questions for Stuart? Hi. Hey, dude. Um, so when the, uh, when the JavaScript finally downloaded, did it replace the whole page as a single page app, or did it just drop islands of uh, kind of dynamic content into a, that, into a div on the page? Yeah, um, in that respect, it would be similar to an isomorphic application. So the server returns the HTML, and the algorithm that React uses, for example, it would see if anything's changed between the HTML that's been rendered already and the, the state of the, the virtual DOM, as it were. So the state, it would go and do some data fetching in the background, load up, and if the DOM's changed, it would then update the actual HTML. If it's not changed, then it'll just stay as it was, returned from the server. So it's a bit intelligent. If the content changes, only then will it, would it update the, the information on the page. So hey. this is almost a follow-on. You, did you have any forms in the site? And if user started half, load, half filling out the form when the JavaScript kicked in, did it wipe out their fields or keep it? And how did you handle that sort of scenario? Um, it's a good question. I, I didn't try that in the prototype. That's something that um, I'll take into consideration as I keep evolving this idea yet. Yeah. Um, I'd assume um, the JavaScript would load quickly enough, so by the time that you got to the form, it wouldn't um, impact it too much, but it's something to have a look into for sure, yeah. Hey, Mike. Hey, Stuart. Is this, yeah. Um, I was thinking about what the stages would be for producing the static HTML files, and it sounds like you would need to have all of your routes statically defined somewhere that that have to be listed out. I know with some of the newer React routing tools, like what is rendered is only determined at render time, but this would have a like a route configuration file that yeah. is needed? Yep. Yeah, um, the approach that I took to this, I didn't define some static routes. I had, um, the, with the Webpack, Webpack plugin, there's two things that got sent into it um, at the build time. There's, in theory, you could go away to the API and request or build up a list of dynamic routes. For, so for example, if you've got a list of blog posts that the URLs change uh, from time to time, you can collate a list of them and then feed it into the rendering function. Um, so that would happen at build time. So you, you don't need to maintain that static list of routes. But you could do if it was a simpler site, for sure. Um, I was just wondering what your opinion was on the um, Ajax escape fragment that like Google offers, as opposed to like user agent sniffing. Yep, um, I personally haven't looked into it too much. Um, is there anything you could tell me about it? <laughs> um, not really. I've just been like sort of you know like wondering. It's just a path that I was thinking of going down because I'm cool. using uh, Angular One for an for an application, and um, obviously it doesn't offer like server side rendering like yeah. it does. And so, yeah. um, I don't have too much experience in that, I'm afraid. So. Okay. Um, it's something we can talk about later, though. We can have a look into it. Is there any more questions? Oh, I was sitting right next to you. <laughs> I tried playing around with this once before, and I found it was real easy until my code on the server to render had to call an authorized end endpoint. Exactly. How do you deal with that? Because I found the server was not authorized, and then it would just mm -hmm. um, die. To go back to the example um, with this protected content, the, um, at this point here, the, the static HTML file that got rendered, it doesn't have to do any authentication at build time. So it's just a static HTML file with a loading state. And then once it loads on the client um, like this, it would go to the API and check if the client itself is authenticated with the API. So it, it doesn't matter about the static file itself. It's just a, a placeholder state. The content that the user needed is just a spinner. Yeah, 
yeah. for, for protective groups like that, yeah. It's um, a pragmatic approach. I suppose if you wanted to have the full state there, then you'd have to go for the full isomorphic um, path with the, the node application, for example. Cool. Uh, some really great questions. Um, Stuart's done a really good job today, and um, it's really cool when people speak for the first time at conferences. Yeah, it's exciting. So let's give them two round of applauses on top of each other. <laughs>